settle down now. We've all had a drink, right? <laughs> I know, it's supposed to be poetry, but they warn me coming in here, you know, Thursday night, Manchester. I saw you coming in. I thought, yeah, maybe they're right. Anyway, what the hell. My lords, ladies, gentlemen, scumbags, maggots, you know who you are. <laughs> yeah. Here we are with some poetry after the lockdown, you know. So we come to the second half of the poetry review, in which he never ducks an issue. He never misuses a word imprecisely. He runs with the wild dogs, and yet he's the leader of the pack. And you know what they say? They say the poetry will warm the cockles of your heart. I wouldn't know much about that. I'm not a medical bloke, am I? <laughs> But I know someone who is, who's the uh, chairman of the board, isn't he? Because he is your own, your very own, Dr. John Cooper Clark. <laughs> Manchester, this is a city, the city of crime. My name's Clark. I carry a badge. <laughs> Behave. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for showing out. Now I've circumnavigated the globe ten times, ten times now, reciting poetry all the way. And I get asked a lot of questions. Questions I can't answer. Questions. Questions I can't answer. Uh huh, uh huh, uh huh. Questions I can answer, like this one though. What is occasional furniture the rest of the time? <laughs> Except actually, scratch that one off the list of questions I can answer on account of I found out the answer to that question. What is occasional furniture the rest of the time? Periodic tables, apparently. <laughs> 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 but there's plenty more of those questions I can't answer. Plenty more of those questions. Questions I can't answer. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Why would you always find one shoe on any flat roof? <laughs> if Jesus was Jewish, why the Spanish name? <laughs> But whatever the question, though, whatever the question I answer is existential. Why? Because I'll level with you. I'm an existentialist. Most of my friends are existentialists. Well, it's company for me. So whenever I'm asked any question of any nature, I answer in the existential. It's only natural. A knee jerk reaction. I've loved you. I'll turn into a meringue. <laughs> Not really. Not really, I was trying to be flip. The point is, I'm an existentialist. So I answer every question in the existential. For instance, I've circumnavigated the globe ten, count them ten times, reciting poetry all the way. I get asked a lot of questions, I think we've ascertained this. And this is always the first question I'm asked wherever I go. Dr. Clark, how did you get here? I answer in the existential, obviously. How did I get here? Same as anybody else, I suppose. My mother my mother and father loved each other very much. They went courting. Then they got engaged. Then they got married. One thing went to another. Nature took its course. Same as anybody else. What else? <laughs> ah, there you go again, Dr. Clark. Off on your existentialist tangent once more, when really, when we posited the question, how did you get here, we merely wished to ascertain what method of transport you employed. <laughs> well, well, why did you say so? In that case, in the best kind of car known to man, and that car is, no, not a ladder, the difference between a ladder and a Jehovah's Witness. 
you can shut the door on a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> the firm expects it's a higher car, higher car, why, higher a car, whenever you require a car, higher a car, baby. Drive the motherfucker anywhere just like you don't care. Put it down a word and say, it's a higher car, baby, pray the person who hired it last. Did not drive it quite this fast, he's dying and dodge it well not last. It's a higher car, higher car, steaming like a salivar from the front bumper to the spoiler bar. Higher car, baby, try not to kill yourself or injure anybody else. Don't forget to fasten your belts. Rinse it, dent it, bank it, crank it, pump it, dump it, scorch it, torch it, crash and burn it, don't return it, must deposit like an army. Who cares? It's on the firm, it's a higher car. <laughs> More about that later, maybe, but uh, in essence, it's uh, to be even borderline obese is a federal offence. <laughs> we got a special fat guy's prison in Chelmsford. <laughs> they got bars five feet apart. <laughs> Where the outer is. <laughs> It's a real problem starting us a riot with that little tin cup. <laughs> Clammy! 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 <laughs> See the problem that would be. But seriously, there, there is a reason for this dramatic weight fluctuation which you're bearing witness to this evening. And, uh, which, uh, as far as I know, dramatic weight fluctuation is the only thing I ever had in common with the late Sir Luther Vandross. <laughs> I never met the dude, I don't know, we could have been like two peas in a pot. <laughs> but what I do know is we had that misery in common, dramatic fluctuation. In the case of the late Luther of Andros, I would attribute his early death, if I might make an educated guess as a doctor, I would say that in uh, the case of the late Luther Vandross, uh, it had to do with a series of bad lifestyle choices. You've got enticing soul food available around the clock, a sedentary lifestyle, prescription SSRIs, need I go on? In my case, uh, with the dramatic weight fluctuation, it has to do with the abrupt cessation of the use of opiate drugs in a non-therapeutic milieu. <laughs> drugs, you fat fuck. <laughs> <laughs> You're not being helpful, frankly. To the extent that I wrote a poem about it, and this one's called, spookily enough, get back on the drugs, you fat fuck. <laughs> when I go back to Longridge Park, does anybody wish me good luck? All they say is, hey, clown, get back on drugs, you fat fuck. Get back on drugs, you fat bastard. Get back on drugs, you fat fuck. We only like you when you're plastered. Get back on drugs, you fat fuck. They say I'm piling on the pounds, but that ain't the reason I suck. Put the donut down and get back on drugs, you fat fuck. Get back on drugs, you fat degenerate. Get back on you schmuck. You're the size of a man at Emirate. You were good once, but I don't remember it. Get back on drugs, you fat jumping G. Hoops are fat. Get back on drugs, you fat prick. <laughs> It's the longest title I'd ever seen. This was before they brought out It's a Mad, 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 World. But before that hit, the longest movie title ever was I Married a Monster from Outer Space. So I had to write a poem even then to commemorate this occasion and uh, 20 years later it was, uh, it was hijacked by the uh, Rock Against Racism people who uh, put it to good use as a kind of anthemic poem for their cause and I was uh, happy to have this happen, obviously ladies and gentlemen, but I didn't write it for that reason but uh, hallelujah, God is great. <laughs> the poem goes like this. 
The Milky Way, she shifts around all three feet firmly off the ground. Two worlds collide, two worlds collide. Here comes the future bride. Give me a lift to the lunar base. I want to marry a monster from outer space. I fell in love with an alien being. His skin was jelly, his teeth were green, big bug eyes. Death ray clear, feet like flippers and cubic hair. I was over the moon, that's event to my place. And then I married the monster from outer space. And we walked out, tentacle in hand. You could sense these were muggers, would not understand. When we got on the bus, they said it's extraterrestrial, not one of us. Bad enough with another race. But fuck me, a monster from out of space. A cybernetic fit of rage. She pissed off to another age. You live beyond recorded time with a new boyfriend, a blob of slime. Every time I see a translucent face, I remember the monster from out of space. <laughs> this one always comes up as a searing indictment of factious Britain on the soundtrack. But the pedantic fact remains, I wrote this 18 months before the B-Act ever got anywhere near the West Mills. <laughs> If anything, I worry I might have given her a few ideas. <laughs> See what you think. <laughs> See what you think. This one's called Beasley Street, and it's ages. Fly off on freezing papers, crank the sound of empty rooms, a clinical arrangement, a dirty afternoon with the fatal germs of Mr. Freud are rendered obsolete. The legal term is null and void in the case of Beasley Street. In a cheap seats where murder breathes, somebody is out of breath. Sleep is a luxury, they don't need a sneak preview of death. Deadly nightshade is your flower man, slow to your meat. Spend a year in a couple of hours on the edge of Beasley Street. In the cheap seats where murder breathes, somebody is out of breath. Sleep is a luxury, they don't need a sneak preview of death. Deadly nightshade is your flower man. Slaughter your meat, spend a year and a couple of hours on the edge of Beasley Street, the boarding houses and the bed sit full of accidents and fleas. Somebody gets in where the missing persons freeze, wearing dead men's overcoats. You can't see their feet. This rib joint shuts, opens up right down on Beasley Street. Cars collide, colours clash, disaster movies filth. For the man with a foot man chew moustache, revenge is not enough. There's a dead canary on the swivel seat, there's a rainbow in the road. Meanwhile, on Beasley Street, silence is the mode, hot beneath the Collar. An inspector calls the perishing stink of squalor impregnates the walls. The rats have all got rickets. They spit through broken seat. A blood stain is your ticket. One way down Beagley Street, the hips are in his hair cut. Drive a borrowed car. It looks like the Duke of Edinburgh, God rest his soul, but not that lady there. Oh, AP, mother to be much like three piece sweets. When shy, catch a drink, then crocodile skis are seen on Beagley Street. The kingdom of the blind. Mr. Magoo is king. Beauty problems are redefined. The doorbell. Do not ring, light bulbs burst, light blisters, it's the only form of heat. Where a fella sells his sister down the middle of Beasley Street, the boys are on the wagon, the girls are on the shelf. Their common problem is that they're not someone else. The dirt blows out, the dust blows in, you can't keep it neat. It's a fully furnished dustbin, 16 Beasley Street. People turn a poison quick as lager turns to piss. Sweethearts are physically sick, every time they kiss, it's a sociologist paradise. Each day repeat. On easy, cheesy, greasy, queasy, beastly, beastly street. <laughs> no, no, we're going up to the end of the season for this. I want to get it out of the way now until next winter. You know, come the winter time, suddenly that Pacific Rim salad starts to look a little bit insubstantial in a cold climate. And that's where this could be. Pies! <laughs> Pies. A homely girl named Lisa couldn't get a geezer. Her mother told her, darling, don't you try. You could knock them down like skittles with some farinaceous bibbles. You'll always get a guy with a pie. When rules of engagement don't apply, and your best moves fail to catch his eye, start rolling out the dough, and he'll never let you go. You'll always get a guy with a pie. <laughs> The salad's in the bin, I've never seen a gym, but I'll be there to watch those fuckers die. I feel fine except I'm hungry all the time, and you'll always get a guy with a pie. Please God, I will be going by and by, to that massive cafeteria in the sky. There'll be tea and angel cake, but please give me a break. You'll always get a guy on high with a pie. You'll always get a guy with a pie. 
Even when they're still, they taste okay with ale at the point where hunger pangs intensify. Cold weather drug that may be eaten in a public house, you'll always get a pie-eyed guy with a pie. You'll always get a guy with a pie. What else you gonna do with that leftover stew and those cuts of meat you can't identify? <laughs> Ingredients of this sort just taste better on the short crust. You'll always get a guy with a high spy with my little eyes, something to begin with. Oh, I you always get a guy with a pie. The father has shook with the She's got a metal plate in her head. I the comb and teens. I thought that's just going to be top of the hit parade from now until the end of time. <laughs> so I said, did it ever get released? It never got released. Never got released, you see. Forty minutes later. I had it then. <laughs> a title like that, I ain't gonna let it go. The rest of it writes itself. <laughs> and would you believe that that's Pam Ayers' favourite poem? <laughs> the most popular poem I ever wrote. And that's Pamela's favourite. I forgot all about this some after until she brought it up and, uh, and I went, when looking up in the loft, you know, I'm a big fan of cash in the attic, so I say attic, the one of the loft. One of the lot does shit in the fiberglass out of the way. I found this bag of notebooks, and I looked in there, there it was, she's got metal plate in her head, and I looked through it and I thought, you know, this. I wrote this in 1979, but you know what, I think it would have a, it could fly with the modern crowd. <laughs> After all, people are still being fitted with cranial plates for one reason or another. <laughs> with, a, with a little bit of modernization, this could take off again. Here's my you coming. I don't mind for audience participation or any creepy gimmicks like that, but here's my you coming. See if you can spot where I modernized it. <laughs> Anne's choice, she's got a metal plate in her head. 77 Sunset Strip was on the TV when my baby took a dip. 11 20, she cries in pain. The pool was empty, I had the fucker drain. To all intents and purposes, you virtually dead. She's got a metal plate in her head. She's got a non ferrous metal plate in her head. A metal plate in her head. It's better that you understand. She's already been dead. Now she's walking in this wonderland with a metal plate in her head. She's in a world where we can't go. The days are motionless, the nights are slow. My life is grey and greenish. Self-reproach fills every scene. I can't help feeling partly responsible. I'm living in the shed. She's got a metal plate in her head. She's got a non-corrosive metal plate in her head. A metal plate in her head. You can't reach her on the mobile phone. <laughs> she can't hear it in the troll zone. She don't know what's happening homes. Take it easy, the doctor said. She got a metal plate in her head. She's got a metal plate in her head. She's got a non-ferrous metal plate in her head. A metal plate in her head. She's got a non-corrosive metal plate in her head. A metal plate in her head. She's got a hypoallergenic metal plate in her head. A metal plate in her head. <laughs> I wrote, I wrote this poem in uh, 1979. I was on tour with a group called Richard Hell and the Voidoids, and they'd, uh, they, they had this uh, superstar guitar player called Robert Quine, the late Robert Quine. Played with everybody, Lou Reed, everybody. Great, original, he's a true original. And I got to, we were on the same bus, and I said, Robert, you know, you're a gifted musician. This can't be the first band you've ever played. And he said, no, I just left a band called The, the Coma Teens. This was the height of punk, and I thought the comet, that's the best name I've ever heard since the Sex Pistols. It's got it all. Youth and oblivion. Two words. What more could you say? That's a punk rock man. So I said, the comet scene, what a great name. He answers, uh, did, you, did you write your own thing? We didn't write our own stuff. We didn't make any covers of it.